So today we are, we are going to be in 2 Kings chapter 6. And this is a remarkable story of the Bible. It's absolutely one of my favorites. Uh, Elisha lived an extraordinary life. If you just read the first uh, six or seven chapters of Kings, it's extraordinary. In 2 Kings, it's extraordinary the kind of life that Elisha lived. And what my goal is today is to show you that when trouble comes into your life, when you look around and you don't know what to do, I want to show you how you can live in a sense of calm, just the way that Elisha did. Elisha should have panicked. He should have had a flip out moment. But Elisha didn't because his heart was full of faith and because he lived in a sense of calm because of the immediate presence of the Lord. And what I want to show you today is because the Bible promises us, and it is a very clear promise to us, that God is a present help in the day of trouble. Have you ever quoted that out loud? Have you ever found yourself in a day of trouble where you need the Lord? You need Him to move in your life? You need Him to do something powerful? You need Him to do something immediate? And have you ever quoted that verse to your heart and said, No, God is a present help in the time of my trouble? God's not going to show up late. He's not going to show up weeks and weeks later and let you figure it out on your own. No, that's not how the Lord does it. He's an immediate, he's a present help in the time of our trouble. Well, this is what happened with Elisha. So I want us to read this today and I want us to pull out several things. We're going to call today, when God surrounds his people. When God surrounds his people. Let's begin in verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse number 8, 2 Kings chapter 6. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God, speaking of Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him, Thus... He used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. So understand what's going on. The king of Syria is warring against Israel. Some things never change, right? This could be a CNN headline. This could be a USA Today headline. So some things haven't changed. Well, the king of Syria is making war against the people of Israel. And what happens is the king of Syria is saying, okay, we're going to ambush Israel. And we're going to do it at such and such place. Well, what was happening is the Lord was showing Elisha what the enemy was about to do. And the Lord was showing Elisha how to avoid these snares, how to avoid these plots, these traps. Do you know what this speaks to us today? It it speaks to the omniscience of God. It speaks that God is all-knowing. He's not only omnipotent. He's not only all-powerful. He's not only omnipresent. He's not only everywhere at one time. The Bible says just his eyes run to and fro upon the earth. No, God is, he is all-knowing. He is all-knowing. And you know what? When the enemy has plans against our life, what, what did we say last week? What's Satan's objective for our lives, for our families? To steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what I love about the Lord? Is he'll give you a heads up on what's getting ready to happen. He'll tell you in advance. He'll help you know what's about to come. And when trouble comes, and let me tell you, if you're like me, I'm someone, I can handle a lot of things by God's grace. But what I can't handle is being ambushed. I can't handle being blindsided. Anybody else like that? If I know it's coming, I can deal with it, right? You remember the the very difficult season our church went through back in August, September, October, November, December, that whole last of last year. I'm telling you, it has been such a difficult, painful time. Some of you heard me tell the story many times, but I was in Nicaragua training pastors, and a pastor showed me a banana tree and said, this tree is so beautiful, it's so healthy, because we cut it to its root. And once we cut it to its root, it grew so beautifully and just became so beautiful. And right then, right then, the first week of October, the Lord spoke to me right there and said, I'm about to chop your church down. I'm going to, I'm going to prune it. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to cut it. 
And you know what? I've never seen Satan fight so fiercely through those months. I've never seen the enemy come against us so fiercely through those months. Out of all the years that I've ever been a pastor, I've never experienced warfare. I've never experienced the fierceness of the enemy. I mean, I'm telling you, Satan, he poured it on. And I'm going, what in the world is happening, Lord? What in the world is happening? Everything felt weird. Everything felt off. Everything felt distant. Everything felt... And I'm going, God, what is happening? And you know what? Through each step of it, the Lord was telling me, this is what I'm allowing. This is what I'm doing. This is, I'm allowing, Satan may be doing it, but I'm allowing it. Satan may be causing havoc, but I'm allowing it. Have you ever heard the old saying, Satan can turn up the heat, but God controls the thermostat? Right? He, he, can, he can make it get a little hot, but ultimately God has his finger on the thermostat. God controls everything. You understand that? Remember when Satan wanted to attack Job and and God said, you have these boundaries. You can do this, but it's going to stop here. Why? Why does God sometimes allow this? Well, let me tell you what it did for me. It caused me to press into the Lord like never before. It caused me to lean on the Lord. It caused me to, to depend upon him like never before. And I don't know if you feel what I feel. If you were here last Sunday... Let me tell you something. I thought last Sunday was the best Sunday we have had in I don't know how long. It was thick in here, wasn't it? And the Lord moved in a mighty way. And that's not an isolated thing. To me, it's like the spiritual climate of our church is rising and rising. How many of you can testify and say, I'm hungry for the Lord today. I want God to move in my life. I want God to move in my family. Something's different. It's different. It's a different climate. It's a different atmosphere. It's a different hunger. And where is it coming from? It's coming from back in October, November, December. The Lord chopped it down. And now what's happening? The Lord's building it back up. Praise God for that. Amen. I was at lunch with a, with a, with a friend of mine that um, we've been friends for years. And I hadn't seen him in like seven or eight years. It's been a long time. Matter of fact, I can tell you how long it's been. It's been about nine years. Because the last time that I was with him, he said, it, we were getting ready to turn eight years old. And he said, Chad, do you realize that in the Bible, eight represents a new beginning? Eight is a brand new beginning. And God's getting ready to do something new in your church. And I'm telling you, God did. And then we have lunch uh, uh, about a month ago. And I'm telling him what happened through those months. And how, how the Lord gave us the vision of the arrow. And what God's doing. And God's moving at such a pace. I'm having a hard time even keeping up with what God is doing. It's not us wanting to do it. God is doing it. And he said, Chad, he said, how old is your church getting ready to be? And I'm doing the math. And I'm like, well, we're 16 years old. And he just laughs. He said, Chad, it's number eight. God's doing a new work. God's doing a new beginning. God's doing something new, something fresh in your body, and he is. And the spiritual climate's coming. But what's the point? The point is, is that every ambush, at every plot, at every disaster, at every hard moment, the Lord was right there ministering to us. The Lord was right there. Let me tell you something. I would have been incredibly discouraged. I was with a pastor this past week. That discouragement was just all over him. He was just so discouraged. My heart just broke for this pastor. He's tried to quit his church three times. Tried to leave the pulpit three times because he's so discouraged. And my heart just broke for him. And I know I would have been in that same place. I would have been in that same throes of discouragement if the Lord wasn't right there saying, Chad, I'm allowing this. Chad, Satan's doing this for for this reason, for this purpose. So don't give up. This is a season, right? And I think that needs to be said to whoever needs this today. It's a season that you're going through. So don't get comfortable. Don't think this is where you're always going to be. Because the Lord always walks us through various seasons. Amen? So here Elisha is. He's he's giving the battle plans to the king of Israel. And he's knowing the Lord is showing him what is going on. The point is, the application is, is that... God will show us what's happening in our life. Listen to Jeremiah 33, 3. See, some of you don't know what to do. You're praying. You're blindsided. You you, you feel like the rug's been thrown out from under you. Listen, call to me and I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you. I remember being a little boy and my pastor would preach this verse. I had a fiery pastor, you know. Like, Like he would unbutton his shirt and he'd get into it. He'd loosen his tie. 
and he'd get into it. Then he'd pull his coat off. <laughs> and then when he took his tie off, I'm like, oh, we're going to be here all day. <laughs> he was fiery. And he used to say, this is God's telephone number. And I always picture one of those big, you know, you know, dial phones, you know, that was on your kitchen wall and had a 20-foot cord to it, you know. He, he'd always say, this is God's phone number, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, God says. You realize that's a promise for every one of you today? Call to me. I will answer you. And what's he say? I will show you the hidden things of your life. So if you're here today and you don't know what to do. And you don't know where to turn. And you don't know what the answer is. Call to the Lord. He'll answer you and he'll show you the hidden things. He'll show you what to do when you don't know what to do. He'll show you the decisions to make when you're not sure of what the right decision is. Call to him. Jeremiah 17.10 The Lord Searches the heart and tests the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his seed. The Lord can search hearts. The Lord can search. Listen, you got someone at work plotting against you. You got somebody at work lying on you. You got problems in your family. You got people trying to deceive you. People trying to ruin you. Let me tell you something. The Lord can show you exactly what they're about to do. The Lord can keep you a step ahead. Do you believe that today? The Lord can do that. It's what he did for Israel. It's what he did against the king of Syria. The Lord showed them exactly where the ambushes were. And how many of you know sometimes Satan attacks you through other people? That ever happened to you? (laughs) And what do you do? You call on the Lord. Now watch, watch what happens. Verse 11. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. He called his servants... And said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, none, my Lord. So he's bringing in his high council here. He's bringing in his top level security here. And he's saying, who's leaking? Who's telling our battle plans? Who's for this king? Who's against us? Who's the traitor? And they say, none, my Lord. O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words you speak in your bedroom. Hmm. Isn't that vivid? He knows everything about you. He's telling all the plans. And he said, verse 13, go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. It was told him, behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent there horses and chariots and a great army. Sent a great army to capture one man. Horses, chariots, that's the big guns of the Old Testament. It's one thing to go with sword and spear. It's a whole other level of battle when you bring horses and chariots. He's sending the big guns for one man. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now watch what's going to happen. Verse number 15. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. Can you imagine that? How many of you take you a few minutes to get woke up? How many of you don't wake up till you have your coffee? Can you imagine stumbling around outside, getting the sleep out of your eyes, and then all of a sudden you look around and the whole city is surrounded a horses, chariots, and a great army, and you know what they're there for. If there's any time to freak out, it's then, right? I mean, it, that is full on panic mode. You have the right to flip out, you have the right to panic. And so, watch what he does. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? This is no joke. Everything's catching up to them. What do we do? Some of you walked in this, into this building today and you're asking the exact same question. Some are watching online and you're asking the exact same question. What am I going to do? My family's a mess. My job is a mess. Our finances are a mess. My health is a mess. What am I going to do? And you're panicking today. Well, what I want to show you is Elisha had the ability to live in a sense of calm. Even when he really should have panicked. This master, uh, the, this servant, all he could see was with his natural eyes. That's all that he saw. And he had good reason to panic. And he goes to his master and says, Elisha, what are we going to do? We're, 
(laughs) And he's flipping out. The same thing happens to us. Anxiety will grip your heart faster than anything. Anxiety will choke the life out of you. You know what the word anxiety means? It literally means to strangle. Some of you have walked in here today and the worship was so good today. It was so sweet today. Communion was so sweet. But some of you can't really enjoy it because you're just strangling. Worry, concern, fret. Strangling the very life out of you. It's because you're seeing with only the natural eyes. Watch what Elisha does. Verse number 16. He said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, first of all, I don't know if you're like me and my personality, but it makes me mad when somebody says, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. How many of your marriages are like mine and Sadie? You got one who worries and you got one who flies by the seat of their pants. Well, guess which one flies by the seat of their pants? It ain't me. Let me tell you something. Sadie's dad, he's the most carefree man you'll ever meet on this entire earth. Nothing bothers him. And Sadie gets it straight from him. Nothing bothers her. She don't worry about nothing. I worry about everything. How many of you know opposites attract? Does that happen in your marriage? Are you opposite? Because opposites attract. Ashley Skelton was doing a school paper uh, for college a few months ago. And she had to ask people, uh, she had to ask a certain amount of people, what would be your why question for God? Like, if you could just ask him anything, why, what would it be? And she asked me. And I thought, well, I had to think for a moment. But I said, nope, nope, nope. Here's my why question. Why do opposites attract? Because it makes marriage hard, doesn't it? Opposites always attract. I have never done marriage counseling with a couple that they were just identical. It's always we're opposite. And opposites truly attract. And so you got two wheels and Two minds and two backgrounds and two ways that people grew up and two, two different ideas of doing things. And then you try to become one flesh. And instead of really being one, it's... Right? That has nothing to do with today. <laughs> that's, all that's free. That's not even in my notes. <laughs> but what's the point? Uh, so, so, you know, I'll, I'll be worried about something. How are we going to pay something? How are we going to get, you know, how are we going to have enough money to do this? And, and I'll talk to Sadie about it. And I'll be fretting and I'll be anxious about it. And I'll be like, well, I don't know how we're going to do this. And she'll be like, oh, it's going to be all right. Oh, my gosh. It makes me mad right now just thinking about it. And I'm like, you're not worried? Because to someone like me, if you're not worried, then that means you don't care. Right? And I'm like, you should worry. It's your butt on the line too. Why don't you care? Now that I think about it, we need marriage counseling. Now that I, <laughs> now that I really, you know, go through it in my mind and go through the conversations. <laughs> but but you see what I'm saying? It makes me mad when someone's like, "Well, well, just don't worry about it. Just just it'll be fine." No, it won't. See, people like me sometimes. I can only see with my natural eyes. Can you imagine what Elisha's servant thought? Now think about it. He's, he's getting the sleep out of his eyes. He sees the city surrounded. And he goes to the man of God. I'm talking the one who should be stable. The one who should be the rock. The one whom he can lean on. The one who who can pray better than anybody in his life. And and here's Elisha's response. The ones who are with us are more than all of they. I don't know what I would have said. But I I think I would have said. He has flipped his lid. He has lost it. He's gone crazy. He's went off the deep end. More than us? It's just me and you, Elisha. What do you mean we're stronger than they? I would go, Jesus, it's over right now. Right now. He's, He's cracked. He's gone. How many of you know that faith has nothing to do with reason? And faith has nothing to do with logic. 
See, there's some of you that God can't move in your life because you reason too much. God can't do the supernatural. God can't do the unthinkable. God can't do the miraculous. God can't bring restoration. God can't bring healing. God can't bring deliverance. God can't rescue you because all you do is analyze and analyze and analyze. Faith has nothing to do with logic, has nothing to do with reason. So watch watch what happens. Verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Notice what Elisha did. See, everybody thought he was crazy. Everybody, it was just his servant. That was the problem. (laughs) What made him look like he was crazy? No, what did he do? He went straight to prayer. Do you do the same in your life? When trouble comes, do you go straight to prayer? When problems surround your family, when problems surround your life, do you go straight to the Lord in prayer? Do you go straight there If you missed Tuesday night prayer, you need to go back on the website and listen to it. We talked about David when David was raided and he lost everything and all of his army spoke of stoning him. The Bible says that David went and encouraged himself in the Lord. David got away. He got away from the noise. He got away from the clatter. He got away from everybody's yelling and screaming and crying and upset. David got away from all of it and David went straight to the Lord and he encouraged himself to the Lord. Do you have that ability? Do you go straight to the Lord in prayer when problems mount in your life? When you don't know what, or are you that servant who looks around and go, God, what am I going to do? I can't handle this. I can't go any further. I don't know what the answer is. Do you go straight to the Lord in prayer? That's what Elisha did. And look what he prayed. He didn't pray, God, I need you to rescue me right now. Do something great. He said, open His eyes that he may see. (laughs) Are you listening right now? See, some of you are waiting for God to do something amazing. God's you're waiting for God to do whatever you but listen, it may be that God's already working, but you're not seeing it. It may be that you need to stop asking the Lord to deliver you and you need to stop asking the Lord to do this or that or this or that. And it may be what you need to do today is pray and say, God, open my eyes. Let me see the blessings that are already in my life. Are we not guilty of that? I'm guilty. I'll pray for, I'll pray for things all day long. And what I really should do is stop and say, Lord, you've already done so much. Open my eyes to what you have done. Open my eyes to what you are doing. Open my eyes to what you are doing right now in my life that maybe I'm completely unaware of. John Piper said it so wonderfully. He said, God, right now, doing 10,000 different things in your life, and you may be aware of two, maybe three of them. God, open my eyes to what you're doing. This is what he prayed for his servant. And watch. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. (laughs) What a difference it would make in your life if you saw the blessings of God today. What a difference it would make if you saw the workings of God. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Are you believing that? Full. Full of chariots and horses, of fire. You say, Chad, that's, that's some Old Testament stuff. My goodness. Would God do the same for us today? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9. Let me show you how much the Lord is with you. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 91, 11, For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. You're telling me God isn't with us. You're telling me that He doesn't command His angels to give charge over us. I was in a Jeep accident one time. I used to have a Jeep Wrangler, and it was gorgeous. It was so beautiful. Ugh. 
And uh, I was driving down a street in Churchill one day, and I heard something real loud pop. And it threw my Jeep into the right side of the road. I overcorrected, and I spun backward, and I broke through five trees and rolled down a large embankment. Jeeps roll really good, I can tell you that. (laughs) I got out of that Jeep and climbed up that hill and looked down at the Jeep, and the wheels were just spinning. The police came, and they brought a record to pull it out and the police said come here look at this where my tires skid because you could see the tire marks as they skid the trees were like this they're massive I wouldn't have broke through them where I broke through the trees were like this where I broke through was like 10 15 feet down of where I should have went out. The cop told me. He said. Look at this. He said it's like something picked your Jeep up. And moved it 15 feet down the road. I'm not trying to be sensational. But I have no doubt. That on that day. Let me tell you what else happened. That was the week that I announced. That we're planting preaching Christ church. And I know what was happening. Satan was trying to harm me. But what happened? The Lord gave his angels charge over me. I broke through five trees, went down an embankment, and didn't even have a scratch. Not even a scratch. Completely totaled the Jeep. May it rest in Jeep heaven. (laughs) Completely totaled it. Let me tell you something. The Lord will give his angels charge over you. Amen? Listen to this great verse, Psalm 125, 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Did you hear that? As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. The psalmist says. God is with you, amen? Now, watch what happens. Boy, this is interesting. Isn't this just a fascinating story? So God opens the eyes of the young man. He sees that the Lord is with them. I can't imagine. Talking about a crazy morning. (sighs) Now, verse 18. When the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed. See, he didn't quit praying. He kept praying. He prayed and said, Lord, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness according with the prayer of Elisha. Now hang on one second. If you've, got a, if you've got a bad boss today, I don't think this is saying go to work tomorrow morning and say, Lord, strike them with blindness. That's probably not a biblical prayer. <laughs> Just because it's in the Bible don't mean you need to pray. Next time you and your spouse have a fight, don't, in Jesus' name, blindness. Don't, don't go there because... <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the point though what's the spiritual application what's the point God made open eyes God, God made blind eyes come open the servant couldn't see all he could see is with the natural eyes and that's most of our problems is we don't see with spiritual eyes That's most of our hang up today. We don't see with the eyes of faith. We don't see what God wants us to see. But in this case, the opposite happened. He made open eyes become blind. That's the supernatural working of God. If you never read of Brother Andrew, you should read Brother Andrew. I've got a new book coming out very soon. I've already gotten two different proofs of it. It's called Awakened to Grace. And it's stories of, of, of great heroes of the faith. And the last chapter of this particular book is Brother Andrew, who smuggled Bibles all in. T- he smuggled Bibles all over the world. Brother Andrew's in his 80s today. He one time did a project called Operation Pearl, where in one night, in one night, they smuggled one million Bibles into China. Brother Andrew is a notch above everyone in my book. 
And Brother Andrew had this old Volkswagen that, and, and see, they told him he couldn't be a missionary because he had a real bad back and failing health. And he went to mission school and they said, your body isn't made for this kind of thing. I'm sorry, but you can't do it. But God called him to be a missionary. So he had to do it. So what he did, he wasn't with an organization, he wasn't with a particular group, and so what he did was he began loading up his little, his little Volkswagen, it was a little blue Volkswagen, and he would drive up to communist borders, and he would have his, his Volkswagen stacked with Bibles, boxes of Bibles in the trunk, in the back seat, everywhere. And if they saw those Bibles, they would confiscate them and he'd be arrested. And it was Brother Andrew who began to coin this beautiful prayer. He would drive up to, a, to the border of Poland or Czechoslovakia or, or Romania. And he would drive up to the border and the communist guards would begin to search the car and they'd begin to look. And here's what he would pray. God, when you walk the earth, you made blind eyes open. Right now, may you make open eyes blind. And they wouldn't see one single Bible. In 2005... A friend of mine, we went to Vietnam and we took Bibles with us. Vietnam's a communist country. And we took loads of Bibles. We loaded our suitcase down. We stacked them in, in all of our clothes, sticking them in our pant legs. I mean, we're just putting them everywhere that we can. And we're in the airport and they're scanning the, the luggage. And we're right there doing what Brother Andrew did. We're saying, Lord, make open eyes blind in Jesus' name go straight through, they hand us our luggage and we take them right to the seminaries, right to the pastors. God has supernatural ability to work in our life, amen? Do we believe that? Or are you too analytical to believe that God can still work today? Are you too logical to believe that God can help you and strengthen you and open doors where there is no way? Do you believe that? He did it for Elisha. Now, here's the beauty of the story, and this is where I'll begin to close. Now, watch this. So, <laughs> so Elisha prays this prayer and says, God, make them blind. And God strikes them with blindness, according to Elisha's prayer. And now this entire army, with chariots and horses, they're all blind. And now, watch what happens. So, verse 19. Elisha apparently goes up to him and says, what are you doing here? Who are you looking for? Watch how clever he is. So verse 19, Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me. I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. <laughs> are you picturing this? I mean, this big bad army is all blind, and Elisha, who they have the warrant for, who they're looking for, says, Boys, you're in the wrong place. Elisha's not here. Follow me. I'll take you straight to him. Now watch what happens. This is beautiful. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, you see what happened? He led them straight to the king of Israel. Should have been a bloodbath. Should have been a slaughter. And watch what happens. The king says to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Now watch what he does. This is, this is unprecedented. This is the enemy. These are the ones, hey, they picked the fight. Syria warred against Israel. They're the ones who started it. They're the ones who's picking the fight. And look what he says. Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Verse 23. Listen how bizarre. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and sent them to their master. Can you imagine being in the Syrian army? And what you think they're going to chop your head off. They're feeding you a great feast. I'd be thinking what kind of. This is my last meal. What are they doing? And they sent them on their way. 
And the Syrians did not come again on raids in the land of Israel. What's the point? Where there should have been judgment, where there should have been condemnation, where there should have been death, Elisha showed them grace. This is the gospel on display in the Old Testament. So you and I are the enemies of God. You and I have broken the laws of God. We are in hostility toward God. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than light. You give us the choice of righteousness or sin, we'll choose sin every single time because that's in our DNA. That's how we're bent. That's how we're wired. We are born sinners. We are in hostility against God. And what Jesus does is in our blindness because the eyes of our heart are blind and we don't know our right hand from our left hand. And what Jesus does is He leads us to the the father and he has grace and he prepares a feast and he loves us and he's kind to us and he redeems us and he forgives us this is the gospel on display in the old testament isn't that remarkable and so today we who are the enemy of god god would have mercy on you god would have compassion on you God will have grace on you. And those of us who know the Lord, let me assure you today, He surrounds His people. Let me assure you that you're not alone. Let me assure you that grace is there. Angels are there. Right? See, uh, people think everyone's got a guardian angel. No. The Lord gives command to angels to encamp around His people. Everyone don't have a guardian angel. God's people have God's angels. You may have a few resigned here or there. I'm sure I have. But for the most part, listen, God surrounds his people. And God's promise is as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. So whatever you're going through today, I want you to be assured God's with you. I want you to take this story and be assured that God can work supernaturally. And for those of you that are listening today or you're in here today and you say, I really don't know what I'm going to do. Pray and say, God, open my eyes. Because God has the answer. God has the way. God has the decision. He has the direction. He has everything you need. God has the healing you need. God has the restoration to your marriage you need. God has all the finances worked out. Let me tell you, if anybody can do math, it's God. He's got it all worked out. If anybody can split the sea, it's God. Amen? If anyone can bring your wayward child back or your wayward children back, let me tell you, it's the Lord today. Amen? It's the Lord. And what you need to do is say, God, open my eyes. Open my eyes. All you see is the trouble surrounding you. That's all you see. No, you need to see God is with you today. And he'll help you. He'll help you. He'll help you. And he'll give you all that you need. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed. If you need to come pray today, I want to encourage you to do that. Michael's going to play for us. And as he plays, why don't you come and why don't you let God work in your life? Why don't you let God do something special? Why don't you let God deliver you? Say, Chad, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. Yeah, but are your eyes open? Has the Lord opened your eyes to the help that you truly have? Come today and say, God, open my eyes in Jesus' name.